The design of steel is an art form that only comes with time and practice. And it's not just about sizing a structure effectively to better resist the loads. When you are designing steel, you also need to know where to spend your time. So how much time should you be spending into the design, into the connection and the detailing? This is where the art form comes in. I'll be going through some of my best advice that I can give you to help you improve your steel design so you can shortcut some of this long learning experience. But it really does require you to go out there and actively apply some of these principles. I'll break down this video into two parts. The first part I'll go through is the analysis portion and using rules of thumb to be able to size up your structure. Rules of thumb are not only important for sizing your structure, but also checking designs you've done from analysis software to ensure that it's got the correct answer. It's highly important to know these rules, not only when you're scheming a structure, but also when you're assessing the design as well. And the second part, I'll be focusing on some of the important aspects you need to know for designing connections in steel frame buildings. When designing steel, you need to understand the difference between analysis and design. As analysis is the simple design of a structure to be able to resist the loads that are imparted upon it. Where design not only needs to incorporate the analysis results so the structure can resist these loads, but also needs to incorporate site conditions, how they're going to put it together. Uh, is it actually buildable? So there's lots of considerations that you need to impart on your design. Design is not actually only about just making sure it's buildable, but also imparting that knowledge to the people that need to know it. And this is really where the art form comes in. Designing steel, the analysis part is really simple. That's where you should be spending the least of your time. Most of the time should be coming down to the detailing, the connections, how they're framing it up and making sure it's buildable. This is highly important when you are starting steel design to understand that you need to be spending most of your time in the connections and detailing of steel structures. It all comes down to those connections. If the connection fails, the structure fails. It has very little redundancy compared to a concrete structure. When you're documenting the design, make sure you're specifying the different elements that are inside your structure, and then you clearly understand how they're meant to behave. So for example, a column is a primary support, so typically supporting a beam or loads over. However, where a mullion is normally facade support, so it's normally got slotted holes at the top that it allows it to move vertically, but takes that horizontal load from the facade loads. And things like rafters and purlins, so typically a rafter is running with the line of the roof, where purlins are running parallel to the line of the roof, and purlins are generally a secondary element as well. So they're normally a lighter structure than your typical roof beams. And then also specifying if you have roof trusses and if you have wall headers is another one that often gets missed. So a wall head is normally taking those horizontal loads for wind, but not taking very many, if at all, vertical loads. So just clearly defining those elements for the purpose that they're there for will help both yourself when you're designing it, but also when someone's putting it together understand the actual true purpose of that element. Just makes it easy to build, put together and make sure you haven't missed anything. And so when we're starting off any design, it's important to know where the building joints are gonna be. You need to allow for thermal contraction and expansion. When the steel is heated up, it generally expands. When it cools down, it contracts. And over a large steel structure, either that flooring or roof, this can lead to some quite big movements inside your structure and lead to significant forces in your members. So you need to allow for joints throughout your building to allow for this thermal construction and expansion. The rough spacing of these joints is roughly about 150 meters in both directions. So when you're framing up your building, get out the architectural floor plans, work out where a good place is to have these joints, then make sure they're no further apart than every 150 meters or so. Now, either side of these joints, as they do allow for contraction and expansion at these points, you're likely to need to have additional bracing frames around these areas. This is a good place to start off with to make sure your structure is stable, getting those three sides of supports and allowing for these movement joints throughout your building. In addition to placing your movement joints at 150 centers at each way, it's also important to look at side your frame to make sure it's both stable in your temporary and permanent conditions. I know what you might be saying. Surely that's for the temporary works engineer. However, with simple design changes, you can both make your structure easy to erect and cheaper to actually build 
as I do not need to put those temporary frame inside there. For simple designs, on columns, especially the top level, is having four bolts instead of two. This wherever possible, as the four bolts allows you to stand up that column and have it stable without the need of temporary works. And also when you're starting off a brace frame at either side, it's starting off with angle braces as opposed to your rod cross bracing. As rod cross bracing typically needs your structure to be temporary prompt until the whole structure is built. Where if you started that first frame with angle bracing, you've made that first base solid and it's stable. So they do not need temporary bracing until they've finished your, the whole build as you've made a stable structure from date naught. There are two simple things that can help make your structure easy to build and cheaper and your steel fabricator will like you for it. So something to discuss early on with the project, especially when you get your steel fabricator on board, is some of those potential changes that will add a little bit more material, but make it quicker and easier to erect. So let's move on to some rules of thumb when sizing a structure. So when you're framing up your building, how far can roughly every element span? For example, a floor beam, you're sitting at about a 12 metre max span. Now you can go further with deeper structures, but it is really becoming inefficient at this point. Roof trusses can span upwards of 17 metres to be somewhat efficient. And then you can go into more of a space frame if you do need those big expanses, which can go upwards of 60 metres. So looking at your spans will dictate what size structure you need to go. Now these are only rules of thumb, they're not hard limits. They're just a good guide when you're starting to frame up your building, where your columns should go and where you need those lines of support. Also looking at span to depth ratios is highly important here as well, as this will give you a rough size of the structure that you need to look at. For example, a floor beam has a span to depth ratio of somewhere between 15 to 18. Roof trusses can be somewhere between 14 to 15 and space frames can achieve somewhere between 20 and 24. Probably one of the biggest things when you're sizing up a steel frame, what is going to be the governing factor? Will it be serviceability or will it be strength? Typically a steel structure is governed by deflection. It's a lightweight structure that allows for great spans, but the deflection limits or vibration limits are typically what are going to govern your design. So let's start off with a typical design that's generally governed by deflection. We can simply work out what size we need to frame up our building. We know the loads, we know the spans, but we do not know the size yet. So if we're looking at the beam formula, as I've got an example here, we can rework either our simply supported beam or a continuous beam formula to work it out from our deflection limits, what size section modules we need. From that, we can now look at our span tables and specify a member that fits into that limit of state. So as you can see, by reworking the formula, it gives us a minimum size of structure we need for a design that is governed by deflection. One good thing about a deflection governed design is that you're able to pre-camber out some of that load. You're able to preset the beam up to get rid of some of those deflection limits that you have in there. So when you're framing up your building, having a look at your dead loads and trying to pre-camber out the majority of this load is recommended. When you're pre-cambering, you want to ensure that you're not over pre-cambering your structure for two reasons. Firstly, if you over pre-camber, the member may never go back to flat, so you've got a permanent hog inside your structure. And secondly, if you're starting to over pre-camber your design, it will typically then become governed by vibration. So there are limits on how much pre-camber you need. As a rough guide, you roughly want to only pre-camber about 80% of your dead load out of your self-weight. So when you're looking at design, looking at your self-weight, times in that by 0.8, and that's roughly the maximum pre-camber you want inside your structure. So after you've framed up your structure, you've taken it out about 80% of that dead load, re-look back at your deflection formulas and you may better see some efficiencies inside your design. Also with steel structures, do not want to be changing your members too rapidly, as this will increase site time, so grouping them together such that they're easy to put together. On longer span floor structures, it may be governed by vibration. So this is in excess of 10 to 12 meters is when you start to reach this point is that your structure may be governed by vibration. So when someone walks across the floor, you can feel them walking on there. And typically in an open office situation, this is somewhat acceptable as you can see the person there. However, in more residential structures where you have walls, people can be perturbed by feeling this vibration. So on longer span designs, 
you need to be critical of your vibration limits. The ISO standards give you some sort of limits of vibration that you can have inside your structure. There's a rough guide that you roughly want to be between 4 hertz and 8 hertz for an efficient structure. If you've got your frequency below 4 hertz, you're starting to move into the point of where walking can actually exacerbate the design through the floor bouncing too much. And the lower the frequency, the softer your structure is. So the more likely it is to be felt through your design. So by knowing that we want to try and keep it between 4 hertz and 8 hertz for an efficient design, there's a rule of thumb for roughly what vibration your structure will have. And that's 18 on square root of the deflection. So on your longer span designs, trying to keep it to 4 hertz, and you can rework this formula now to work out what your deflection is. And as we now have the deflection, we can go back to the formula that we worked up before to work out what moments of inertia this needs to be. And from this, we are able to quickly size up our design. Although most steel structures are governed by deflection, there is the odd occasion where it's governed by strength. When you're sizing up your steel structure, it's easy to check not only your moment of inertia, but you can also reverse the formula and also check your section modulus. And when you're looking through your tables for the minimum size required, you can frame them up such that the critical design case still governs. The one important thing about designing your steel structure for strength is knowing her effective lengths, especially for beams and especially for roof structures. Roof structures typically have gravity loads, which is just the self weight of the structure and maybe some live load that is imparted upon it, but they also have wind loads across the structure. So wind blows across the structure to potentially uplift inside your design. So you potentially have moments up and you potentially have moments down. And because of this, it requires different flanges to be restrained. So what flange needs to be restrained for what force? So if we have a tension force, it's obviously pulling taut. So there's no way that structure can buckle from a tension load. It's the compression flange, as when it's compressing, it has potential to buckle in size and then if severely reduce the moment capacity as it rolls over. So you need to restrain that compression flange. So when you've got your gravity forces, that would be the top flange. And on a typical steel frame structure, you'll have your purlins on top, so the top flange is well restrained. However, in the uplift force, as the purlins are on the top, the bottom flange is not really restrained. And this is why we have fly braces. So the fly braces typically inside a steel frame design are there to restrain the bottom flange for those uplift forces. So there's two things you need to be careful about, where you need those fly braces and the connection details that you're looking at. As we're talking about purlins, another important fact that's often sometimes overlooked is which way especially a Z purlin should face. And there's a simple rule that you can do to remember this, and that is ducks always go uphill. So if you look at a purlin, it's got the top that looks like the beak of the duck and the back that looks like the tail. So when you're putting your purlins inside your design and looking how it's framed up, making sure the ducks are always going uphill. As if they're going the other way, it leaves a great place for items to pull and collect at the top, where this way there's very minimal dust or water collected inside your purlin structure. So that's just a pro tip when you're putting your purlins up, ducks always go uphill. And if you're finding this content informative, smash that like button so I can produce more of these videos. It gives me a good update of what type of content you would like. As we can see, the design of a steel structure for strength and deflection is relatively simple. You do not have the complexities that you do with a concrete structure where the structure changes over time. And at the start, I was saying you should spend most of your time in the connection detailing. And when you're going down to design those connections, I highly recommend you manually sketching up those designs. So that's either by pen and paper, in Revit, or CAD, or other software as well. However, putting it together in your head about how you're gonna to put together and detail it, and the physical act of you putting the structure together, you may see a couple of things. Firstly, you look at especially those complex designs. You may see there's a lot of section cuts you need. And providing an isometric on a more complex design, may actually help tell the story better as well. So I encourage you to bring out those pens and paper and draw some isometric sketches of the design that you're looking at. As when you're sketching it up, you may realize there's some areas where they may not be able to get to bolt in. So you need to modify your section design accordingly or connection design. And maybe you need some additional framing in there to allow it to be built. And when you're framing up those designs, especially inside an existing structure, there's also drawing the existing structure in the design as well as it may be constrained in how you actually be able to build your building.
This is really where you should be spending most of your time, not only because of the lack of redundancy in a connection design, but also allowing for a builder to put it together. It's highly important to understand that a steel frame design is not being put together inside a factory. So you have people on site, so you want to not only keep it quick, simple and easy to put together, but also looking at those site constraints. Is it physically able to be put together as you've designed? There are many different connection types that you can have inside your steel structure. These are flexible connections, cleat plates, you can have flexible end plates, angles heat plates, bearing pads, cleat angles, rigid connections, fully welded, bolted moment, end plates, bolted cap plates, splice connections, either welded or bolted. As you can see, there's a lot of different connections that we can use to put together a steel frame building. It's important to know the limits and constraints of each of these and where you should actually apply them. So most of the time you're trying to keep your structure as pinned as much as possible as a splice connection, especially a moment splice connection, leads to a weak point of potential failure. So wherever possible, limiting your steel frame design, but sometimes you do need to allow for those splices. For example, steel is limited by the amount that it can be transported. And typically, the probably about the max span you can get, especially on a semi-trailer, is roughly about 19 meters that can be transported in a reasonable length. And sometimes that can be as low as 12, depending on what site constraints you have. So it's important to not only look at these, so when you're framing up your design, especially long frame structures, if you do need to put moments in, if you do need to put moment connections in, especially splice connections, it's making sure they're at inflection points wherever possible, where the minimum moment will be impacted upon it. So it'd be mostly shear going through these joints. So sometimes you may not be able to get effectively 19 meter spans everywhere. You may have varying spans depending on the forces that are imparted. So when you're looking at connections, there's two primary designs. Either got your welded connections or your bolted connections. Typically, welded connections are done inside a factory. And so they're put together frames that are big enough that are transportable, welded together inside the factory and brought to site. Sometimes you do need welder connections on site, but you're trying to avoid these. As welding is a complex design and to ensure that it was done properly, and typically on site, you're limited by site access and the materials that you have on hand and access to the actual connection. So wherever possible, not only for design, but also for costs, is limiting your welded connections because they're both hard to do and expensive to build. This brings us to the other point, which is bolted connections. And this is typically what you want your on-site connections to be. And with bolting, there's a couple of important factors to look at, as not only do you have different classes of bolts, we also have different bolt connection types as well. So in Australia, we typically have two bolt types. I see that 8.8, which is your high strength bolt, that is 800 grade, or 4.6, which is your low strength bolt at roughly about 400 MPa. There are limitations behind where you should use them. Obviously, when you've got your standard bolted connection on highly loaded structures, you want to use your 8.8s. However, there are limits of where you can use these. 8.8s cannot be welded. When they're welded, they become brittle through the heat treatment connection. So if you've got studs welded to the end of a plate, they cannot be 8.8 bolts, they need to be 4.6. And as they are on the weaker side as well, those 4.6 bolts, they'll typically be done on your purlins and other structures that are not going to be so much governed by strength. As they're a lower grade, they're relatively cheaper. Your 4.6 bolts can also be bent easily as well. So typically on holding down bolts, where you've got a bent frame, a welded frame, you'd be using those 4.6 bolts. And as I was stating, there is also a number of different connection types as well. You either have slash S, slash TB, or slash TF. The typical connection type for both 8.8 and 4.6 is S or snug tight. A snug tight bolt is still quite taut. You're trying to tension up as much as possible with a big wrench on site. However, they allow for slip and typically for your standard shear to shear connection, so your pin joints, is where you'll be using your snug tight bolts. Most of your connection details will be those snug tight bolts. So they're not only just for your connection types, but typically for connections that are done in end plates, cleat plates, or bolts that are just really transferring shear. The second most common type is TB. Now TB bolts are tightened to a specific requirement. And as they are tightened, the shear capacity and resistance of these bolts is reduced. However, they're typically used in connections that are prevented primary and shear and sliding effects. So typically in your splice connections is where you use these to prevent your connection from sliding as much as possible and allowing it to resist those sliding actions. 
And then the next connection, which is the least used, is TF or friction tight. Friction tight is an expensive connection detail and it only really limits slip in critical structures in serviceability limit stones. A friction tight bolt will still slip under ultimate forces. So you should be really trying to limit where you put them. They're highly expensive as you not only need to resist the slip inside your structure through tightening them up, similar to TB, but you also need to treat the surface of the two metals that are going together. As you need to prevent those slips, you need to make sure there is a friction on there to prevent those sliding actions. So wherever possible, you're trying to limit where you need those friction bolt types to go. And there's very limited situations that you actually need your friction bolt type. So the two primary actions, the majority is your stunk type bolt slash S, then for your moment connections is TB. Then for critical slip connections is only where you use TF and use it sparingly. Something you may not know when you're designing your steel structures, something that you may not thought about is how big a hole do you need inside a bolter connection? This is roughly needing a two mil clearance around the annulus of your bolt, which is the area of the bolt between the bolt thread and the hole of the cleat plate. For example, a bolt that is M16, you roughly need an 18 mil hole. Just something to note when you are putting it together, how much slip you're actually going to see. Another thing that I often see that is often overlooked is mismatching of different metal types. And this is typically mixing steel with aluminium, especially on facade framing structures. So what's the problem of mixing these type of metals? Well, if you put a aluminium structure and connect it metal to metal to a steel structure, you'll have a corrosive action through rusting of the steel frame building. This occurs due to the aluminium being higher on the galvanic scale than your steel frame. So it'll act as an anode to your aluminium structure. Similar to anodes that you put on steel reinforcement, which will sacrificially rust over your reinforcement, same thing happens between the mixing aluminium and steel. However, the steel has become the anode and it'll rust out and pre prematurely cause aging inside your structure. So when you're mixing these two type of metals, you need to make sure they're isolated electrically. So there's neoprene pads, neoprene washers, neoprene covers. So there is no metal to metal connection between these two elements. As if you do connect them and do not put these isolating pads in, you'll have the steel structure artificially age through acting as an anode to your aluminium structure. This is similar to how the protection of galvanizing works. As the galvanizing is placed on the outside, it will typically act as an anode and rust prior to your steel, sacrificing itself essentially. Something to be careful when you're mixing metal types, ensuring that you haven't created a connection that's going to artificially age your structure through this galvanic reaction. I hope you enjoyed the content and if you do have any pro tips for anyone else designing a steel frame building, please comment below. And I've got two reasons for you to try and smash that like button. If you made it to this point, you've clearly liked the video, it's all the way at the end, so smash that like button. But if this video gets over 500 likes, I'll do a full video on the rule of thumb design for steel structures. So make sure you smash that like button to get the rule of thumb on steel design. If you haven't subscribed at this point, hit the subscribe button for weekly updates and to get all updates, you need to ding the bell. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.